Okay. Um, I want to look at the question raised in the readings by uh, Susan Wolf and others um, about what is actually required. I'm going to come back to the question of, um, of self-interest and, uh, and ethics, but I want first to ask this question of what is in fact required by acting ethically? Because I think the, the claim that to act fully ethically we have to be moral saints and understanding moral saints as somebody that, as Susan Wolfe says, neither I nor those about whom I care most uh, would want to be, um, and that we should be glad that we're not, is presents a view of morality that we may feel is, is not for us. We may share Susan Wolfe's idea that that is, to some extent, a repugnant idea. But it's, it's an interesting question to pose um, as to to what extent that is an ideal that we should strive towards. And some of the things that Wolf says about a moral saint um, are, I think, a caricature of what we might see as living a good life, looking at some of the people that we have actually met, uh, in, encountered in various ways in this course. So Wolf says that the moral saint would have to be very, very nice, you know, as if they wouldn't ever have a, a sharp tongue or anything like that. Um, might be dull-witted, humorless, or bland, um, uh, and wouldn't be involved in gourmet cooking or high fashion. Well, um, maybe the last of that is true to some extent, um, <laughs> given that uh, it depends a little bit what you mean by these things. Um, you might still be a good cook, but uh, if gourmet cooking means that you're putting a huge amount of effort and perhaps uh, significant amounts of money because you're buying very special ingredients to providing a gourmet meal, it might be that you feel that, given the problems that the world has, that's not the best priority for your time and, uh, and money as well, for your efforts. Um, and uh, if high fashion also involves uh, wearing designer clothes, um, uh, looking out for the latest fashions, again, I think you know, there we can perhaps agree with Susan Wolfe that um, a truly ethical person would not regard those things as priorities. Might take an interest in them to some extent, but they would not be priorities that would uh, occupy a lot of your time or your money. So I think the things in the lower paragraph you might agree with, the things in the upper paragraph, I certainly think we ought to challenge. Um, and it depends on what we actually mean by uh, a moral saint. So perhaps you might think of Gandhi, for example, somebody who um, lived very simply, uh, uh, was very concerned about, um, about the poor, uh, was very devoted to the independence, uh, the struggle for independence of uh, India, um, and uh, was prepared to really to make any kinds of sacrifices to do that, um, including the use of nonviolence uh, in the face of uh, the British uh, colonial forces in India, which no doubt also carried significant risk. You couldn't really predict. Uh, what would be the result of nonviolent protests against an armed uh, imperial power? So that's one vision of a moral saint, but probably one which very few of us would have the chance to actually lead that role, even if we aspired to it. Coming a little closer to our possibilities, this is Paul Farmer, um, the founder of Partners in Health, an organization that began by providing healthcare for the rural poor in Haiti and has now expanded worldwide. Um, Paul Farmer was a, uh, a Harvard Medical School graduate and um, obviously could have had a very comfortable medical career um, anywhere in the United States, uh, but instead he chose to uh, spend his time in Haiti. He actually visited Haiti as a student, did an internship there and decided he couldn't let go. He couldn't just go back to the rest of his normal life. It transformed him to uh, having the goal of improving health care for the rural poor everywhere. So, yes, that's um, someone more like a, a modern saint, perhaps, um, but you know, certainly not somebody who has no other life at all outside that. He has a, a family as well. 
Um, and then we've met some people who might we might regard as moral saints in this course. Zell Kravinsky, who gave away most of his money as well as a kidney. Um, Alexander Berger, who also donated a kidney and is working for GiveWell, we saw on screen. Um, and uh, Julia Wise was here, of course, speaking to our class. Um, and although Julia and her partner have relatively modest incomes, um, I mean, certainly above, uh, above the American median, perhaps, as, as uh, partners, but, but not much, really, ar around that area, um, and uh, are giving away almost half of it. That could be considered saintly, but I don't think you get the impression that uh, Julia is someone who is not interested in anything else except um, doing what is right, or certainly not who is uh, dull or humorless or bland. Uh, if you read the Giving Gladly blog, I think you see that uh, that's not the case at all, that she gets a lot of enjoyment about what she's doing uh, and does it with energy and enthusiasm. And uh, so I think, you know, perhaps you could say this, she's not a moral saint. She probably would not herself claim to be a moral saint, but she's certainly someone who's living a, a highly ethical life and who is enjoying it and being a well-rounded person at the same time. So maybe we want to have a sense of moral sainthood, which is not so extreme as uh, that which uh, Susan Wolfe wants, and regard this as a desirable ideal to promote because it is something that's possible for many people to live and to sustain and not to go into some sort of burnout or uh, uh, feel that you failed because you're not absolutely perfect in every respect. So let's um, draw this to a conclusion by looking at this large question of um, what meaning life can have. And that's a question which um, people sometimes say, well, what's the meaning of life? Um, and that question can be asked in different ways. Um, in one, from one sense, people may think that what you're really asking about is all of life. What is the meaning of the fact that there is life at all? All of the living beings that exist on our planet, or perhaps people just think of all of the human beings who exist on our planet. What is the meaning of that? But that's a question which certainly does have a presupposition. That is, that in some sense, there is some meaning to all of that life. And usually that goes along with the idea that it was created and it was created by a being with purposes. And if that's so, then of course you could say, well, the meaning of life is, let's say, to live in accordance with the will of the creator. So you can answer that general question in that way, but it's difficult to answer if you don't hold that kind of view. Because then you might well say, well, life just occurred. Life evolved, developed out of non-living molecules that uh, could engage in chemical uh, reactions that led them to replicate, um, led uh, DNA to be produced, led, uh, therefore, to other patterns of evolution, and so we're just here. And in that sense, there's no overall meaning to it. There's no overriding meaning of that kind. So that would be a secular view, which would deny that the question, what is the meaning of life, is one that can be answered. On the other hand, we can say, what meaning can we give to our lives? We can think about our ultimate ends, and that's a different question, and a question that we can certainly discuss and have different views on it. So, as I've been saying, one answer to that might be, the meaning we can give to our lives is to find happiness for ourselves and for those we care about. And we can find meaning in our lives that way. We could also say we can find meaning in our lives by making the world a better place, by living an ethical life. Those are certainly things that we can say by knowing that through our lives we've done what we can to make the biggest possible positive difference to the world as a whole. And uh, if that's so, then there's that question that I 
asked before and didn't quite complete discussing about, can we get a harmony between our own happiness and the happiness of those we care about and making the world a better place or living an ethical life? Or do we have to choose? So I'm, for me, the meaning of life is, the meaning of my life is one or the other of those differences. Well, I'm going to wind up with uh, this quote from uh, somebody who was a good friend of mine who uh, worked in the animal movement. Was um, not sure if I've mentioned him at one stage in the class earlier, but Henry Spira was uh, the person who, I guess if you pick up a bottle of cosmetics and you see on it, not, not tested on animals, um, it's primarily Henry who you can thank for that change. Um, he started a campaign back in about 1980 against Revlon because of the tests it was doing on rabbits. It was putting its cosmetics into the eyes of rabbits to see whether uh, it was going to cause damage to eyes. Um, and uh, Henry started a campaign not to say you can't do this immediately because he realized that they were not going to release products that uh, could be harmful to human eyes, but rather to say put a small percentage of your revenues towards developing an alternative so you don't have to blind rabbits to make your cosmetics safe. So it took some years. Uh, it didn't just stop at Revlon. When Revlon agreed to do that, after getting a lot of very bad publicity, um, he went to Avon and Bristol-Myers and a number of others, and uh, they all put into a fund, and they did develop alternatives so that cosmetics, uh, by and large, can be tested without uh, inflicting suffering on animals. Um, and uh, I interviewed Henry towards the end of his life. He knew that he was uh, dying. He had cancer. Um, and I wanted to make a little video of him, which you can find online. It's called uh, uh, Henry Spiro, One Man's Way. I mean, it's just called Henry, One Man's Way, I think. Um, and, uh, but this is a quote, which is in, um, uh, also put in an essay. So... He was looking back on his life. This is the life satisfaction question, I suppose, but he was asking it with a long perspective um, as he knew that he was coming to the end of his life. And he said he wanted to feel that his life amounted to more than just consuming products and generating garbage, which is this picture of what a lot of people's lives in a consumer society are like. Um, one likes to look back and think that one's done the best one can to make this a better place for others. Not a sense of duty, so it's not, it's not this idea that there's something imposed on us from outside, but it's rather, for Henry, it was what he wanted to do. Um, what he wanted to do, and he feels best when he's doing it well. And I say, I knew Henry for many years, um, and until he was really ill, he, I'd say he got up every morning with energy and zest uh, to think about how he could advance the goals that he was working for, um, which, to say, in the later stage of his life were about animals, although he did, I should say, uh, do a lot of other things earlier on before he became aware of the needs of animals. He marched in the civil rights movements in uh, the American South in the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, he worked for, um, he worked for uh, against corrupt unions in the National Maritime Union because he was a merchant seaman for some years. So I think he, he did things like that for his whole life and uh, was able to look back on his life towards the end of it with a great deal of, of peace and satisfaction. And I think that's something that we could all hope to do when we reached that stage of our life. So let me wind up at uh, that point. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time anyway. Um, I'll thank you very much for your attention, your participation in the course, and uh, I hope you've got something out of it yourselves. Thank you.